Yeah. Call the meeting to order. Would all who wish join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? Okay. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, for liberty and justice for all. We have several proposed agenda adjustments, uh, which appear in the board copy in red. <coughs> So I would propose to make a motion to add item 7B II, UTC 910 satellite program at OHS. Add uh, item 9.F.I policies revision GAI guidelines and move item 9E before 9A. I also add another. Remove 9D, the OMS construction application that's not quite ready to bring forward tonight. And to drop 9B, is there a second? Second. Any discussion? We're all present in person, so all in favor? Pass is five to zero. Next up is organizational meeting, first meeting after the election. So we need to refill offices. Um, no actual changes in the people sitting in the room, but uh, but the but you know the offices all come due and uh, get refilled from scratch. First up is chair. So if you don't object, I will make a motion to nominate you for chair. Okay, I don't object. I will second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Abstain? Passes four zero one. I'm going to return the favor, Jake. <laughs> uh, Vice chair. Yeah, no problem. I would make a motion to uh, appoint Jake Eckert to vice chair. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion or questions? All those in favor? Opposed? Abstain? Passes four to zero. Who one? Policy subcommittee. Mark and I have done that. I'm willing to keep serving if people want me to. What's your state, Mark? Yeah, same for me. I'm happy to. Do it. I'm also happy if somebody else is a burning desire to do it. So I will make a motion for Brian McGill and Mark Floor to serve on policy subcommittee. My second. Discussion. All those in favor? Yes. Opposed? Abstain? Yes. It is zero to two. Uh, curriculum. I think Mark has been a member. I have been ex officio. I have not been one of the two designated members. Um, I've been a member, but I've, I've had trouble. But with we knew members. that at the time. So, I mean, there's there's no uh, criticism or, but uh, we should pause sorry. and think about this one. <laughs> I've been in some of them this year, um, which I've enjoyed, but again, I missed a lot. So, so it's, it's second Thursday at 3.30. Um, so, I'm sorry, am I hearing correctly that it's right now? Officially, it's it. Well, it's Mark and Noah, but Noah hasn't been able to make many. Mark makes them all, and you make them all. Is six. More or less. I don't make them all. I make most. I wouldn't put in sale. Are you wanting to? Is your schedule change? Is that something you want to try and do, or is that something you'd like to be relieved of? I mean, I can keep trying to do it, and I've, I've managed to figure out how to block out that time, but it's still. Tricky. I, I can keep trying to make more and more of them as I have them, but people want more consistent. Brian, uh, that being said, are you still willing to serve as uh, all? Yeah, I mean, I would, since I'm chair again, I would continue to go ex officio. Yeah. yeah. Either way, I'm okay. happy to do whatever people want. <laughs> I mean, I enjoy participating when I can. But, uh, correct me if I'm, I'm sorry, correct me if I'm wrong. They're open meetings. You know it could go if he's on the committee or not, right? That's correct. They're notice meetings, so it's anybody can show up. It's okay. Are, are you gonna object if I nominate you to formally be on that committee? And I, no, it's really whatever whatever works for Noah and the rest of the <clears throat> just my, I'm, I'm, happy, I'm happy to stay on. <laughs> So I will make a motion to nominate uh, Mark Brewer and Brian McGill to serve on the curriculum committee. Second. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Abstain? Passes three to zero to two. Next up is JPDC Joint Professional Development. This meets uh, three times 
three or four times, four times a year, uh, every couple of months. Uh, it's uh, in the union contract and it's a chance for the union and the board to sit down uh, in a less formal mm -hmm. conversational setting and consult. Uh, I think that's been you and I, Jake. Mm -hmm. My attendance has not been so great just by arbitrary conflicts, but in general, it's something that uh, I can do and I would intend to do. But um, if somebody else wants to do that position, that's that's fine too. I might volunteer. I, I haven't been able to make the commitments of the DEI uh, committee. And um, so I'd be willing to pick up the GPDC as a, like an exchange. So I'm pulling my weight. If okay. people are open to that. Mary Kevin. And then yeah. are you happy? Yeah, I, I, I'll continue to do it if that's what's wanted. Okay. I, I would make a motion to uh, appoint Jake and Kevin to the JPTC. I will second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Same. Passes three to zero to two. Uh, UTC. And his back. Kevin, I like he, to get to he comes back and brags about the great meals he gets, so he may have competition. <laughs> it is a very nice place. It's got a nice mission, too. But I'll share. <laughs> <laughs> so am I hearing you correct that you'd like to continue? I would like to continue. So I will make a motion uh, for Kevin to uh, the UTC board. I'll second. Discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Abstain? Passes three zero to two. Uh, Spruce. Yeah, I do that currently. I'm willing to continue to do it unless someone wants to take it. I would make a motion to appoint Jake to uh, the Spruce uh, representative. Is there a second? A second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Abstain? Passes four to zero to one. Just to point. Out those last two are formal because those uh, people will get to go vote on regional bodies for budgets and directors and things like that. Uh, building committee, we haven't talked about it. Do we no. want to? This this was created three or four years yeah. ago. It's kind of looked at its purpose. Right. Anybody on the board have an opinion that we need to keep the building committee going? Should we suspend it? <clears throat> okay. So we will not fill the building committee at this point. The wellness committee. Doing it. I've been struggled to get meetings together, although we have gotten some together recently and have a little momentum. Um, but happy to keep hurting it or have other people if they want to. I'll make a motion to nominate Noah. Can I, can I make a motion? You can first. <laughs> my first motion, I think. <laughs> I'll make a motion to nominate Noah Attorney for the Wellness Committee. Do I have a second? One second. Ooh. Any discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Abstain? Passes four to zero to one. You've got a hundred percent success rate on your motion, Kevin. So you did it. Um, DI. That, that's been myself and Kevin. But I pretty much heard you say that's uh, not a good time yeah. for you at this point. I don't think I've made anything in the past year, and I've had trouble making that commitment. So it's uh, it's at three thirty. It's usually been a it moves around. It's three thirty in the afternoon, but sometimes Thursday. Often. And we've been meeting every other month. Is that right, Susan, or quarterly? I can't every remember. Every other month, month or quarterly. Yeah, this year we've been meeting quarterly from about 3.30 till 5. Most of them have been on Thursdays. We've had to do a Monday. And it involves involvement with a subcommittee. So we have four or five subcommittees and folks are kind of in work groups in the between times. That I <laughs> schedule in consultation with those subcommittee members. All right, those are scheduled ad hoc. So four to five people having to agree on a schedule. Anybody else want to uh, serve on that? It is an afternoon time, which makes it harder for some people. I mean, we have effectively operated with one for the past year, but it certainly would be, I don't think anybody on the board is lacking commitment to the notion, so. Anybody wanted to uh, volunteer, even if it was not um, something they could commit to every time? I do just want to throw out, uh, we have 
one that's not listed here that Shauna, thank you, reminded me of. Stipend committee is not something that's listed, okay. but we do have a board member typically yep. pointed to that. So just if you're thinking about this, we have one more. One that was Kevin's. <laughs> I made one of the ones he remembered. <laughs> <laughs> it does not meet very often. Yeah, it's quarterly. Or not quite four times a year. I mean, I'm happy to continue and not make very many of the meetings. I mean, yeah, I could try <laughs> making similar number of meetings too. Um, They're good people. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I, again, it's like for me, it's the worry of the time commitment, like making those times. I mean, not to choose for you, but if you were both equally different and different, Kevin at least has the history and the continuity with it. <laughs> Recognizing that neither of you are going to, you know, be able to make it every time. That, does that work? Yes. Or, or did you? No, no. You want the stipend committee because I was on the stipend committee. Um, that does not meet very often, and it is not very long. Um, but I did forget for about a year uh, and before that's I attended. All remote. It is all remote. It's a Zoom yeah. meeting. Uh, um, Shauna takes care of the whole thing. Yeah, I zoomed in for Shana. Google Meet. Maybe it's it, uh, there's a remote option. There's remote like, option. I can't remember if it's all remote or if there's a remote option. We Which we've been not... doing all remote since COVID, and probably will keep doing it. People seem to like the stipend committee remote. It's a light lift. Shauna runs it very well. It's very organized. It's not very long. And yeah, I still have failed to show up. You're really selling it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, seeing indifference, I'm going to make a motion. Oh, no, I'm, I'm the other person. Somebody else want to make a motion? I'm or the DI motion. committee? I'll, I'll make a motion to for what? For myself and Kevin, maybe for the DI. For, DI, for Brian McGill and Kevin Roberts to serve on the DI committee. Is there a second? I will second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Abstain? Passes 302. Stipend committee. Did I hear that following on Noah at this time around? <laughs> okay, I would make a motion that uh, Noah is the representative for the stipend committee. Is there a second? No, second. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Abstain? Passes 401. Uh, we discussed student reps last time. That's not part of the organizational meeting, but um, I guess, yeah, no, now that we're switching to November, we're still going to be out of sync in a different way. But uh, the student thing will go to rotating toward the end of the school year uh, going forward. So uh, can I actually ask a question on, on that. Yeah. Since, since our election got changed against our rule, um, are we going to have, are we going to have, we, there shouldn't be anybody here up in November, is there going to be? This November? No. 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 Next week's election will be in November of 2025. It's people who were, would be up next March. They'll be up in November. Would be up in November. Instead. And then the same thing, Brian and I would be up in November of 2027. Right. Yeah, so yeah. essentially the first time around, everyone's serving extra time. Yeah, everybody sitting here just got an extra six months added to your term. Whether that's a good thing or a bad thing is like depend on individual well. perspective. But <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, I would make a motion to approve the minutes of February twenty seventh, twenty twenty four, as presented. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion or corrections? Thank you, Rachel. This is not normal to never have corrections, so we appreciate your fine job on that. All those in favor? Passes five to zero. And to boil down that last meeting to three pages. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, I don't have a list of warrants. Are there any warrants we need to do yes. tonight? Warrant 18, payroll agent Kevin Roberts, Kevin Thank you. I would make a motion to approve regular Warren 18, payroll Warren 18, uh, main purse February warrant. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion or questions? All those in favor? 
passes five to zero. Floor is open for public comment. You'll note we have guidelines in the public comment. Um, there's a, uh, I'm not gonna impose a, a time limit, which puts a default time limit of five minutes. And um, we are not allowed to discuss employees positively or negatively, uh, but uh, just about anything else is fair game. Uh, the floor is open. Is there any public comment? Saying none, we'll move on. Uh, acknowledgements. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the show choirs, middle school and high school. I know both went to districts and did well. And the uh, OMS chess team finished third in the state. But quite a talk about uh, dynasties in Orono. Uh, the middle school chess is pretty close to it. So congratulations to all of those participants and coaches. Uh, Kevin? None at this time, thank you. No? Um, yeah, I guess just after our conversation last time about pedagogy and teachers, I just want to acknowledge the work that teachers have put in being really creative in their teaching here. And, and you can say, I just got reflecting on like my past teachers and how much they influenced me and the creative non-traditional things they did. And I can see that here with a lot of teachers. And I'm just really grateful for all the work that they do that it doesn't always get uh, paid back. So. Okay. Uh, you. Students, anything? Uh, I wanted to shout out the One X with their uh, good showing at their district's competition. Um, and they got some shout outs from people that are mentioned in our report. Yeah, and shout out to all the new inductees to the National Art Honor Society, their ceremonies last night, and shout out to Mrs. Lawrence for all the hard work she put into setting all that. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, I have a few. I want to um, acknowledge the um, OHS Boys Varsity Basketball team. We haven't met since they um, finished their route back to the state game and uh, brought home the gold ball again. So congratulations to that team and coaching staff for back-to-back -back championships. And to Pierce Walston, specifically, there were a lot of accolades, but Pierce was selected for a pretty prestigious honor selected as the Max Preps main player of the year for the entire state for boys basketball. So congratulations to Pierce. Um, also uh, on a related note, Mike put his winter athletic um, kind of summary report in your folders for your review. Um, and uh, one thing that you're gonna hear a little bit more about, I think in the board reports, but I wanted to acknowledge Meredith Diamond's successful grant application for an outdoor um, learning initiative for um, kind of a step up program for ninth graders during the summer uh, for $53,000. So um, took a lot of effort and really excited to, for that successful grant application. Great, awesome. Uh, let's see, we're on to reports, principal reports, Carrie. Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> I'm just going to really briefly highlight for you three things from my report tonight. And first will be a shout out to our PTO and all of the family and community members that helped to put together the family dance on March 2nd. There was a really fantastic turnout. They had more than 50 families and hundreds and hundreds of people in the building um, enjoying an evening together. And a big thank you to uh, Ms. West for being the admin on site that evening as I was not available. Um, so it was really a wonderful opportunity for that. Uh, to take place. Um, I don't think events like that have happened um, most recently. So it was really exciting to see. And I had a few photos in my board report as well as in my March newsletter, if you'd like to take a look. Uh, the second thing I'll highlight is March is pretty busy for ASA students um, comparatively to other months of the year. Um, we have um, uh, kindergarten and pre-K registration night happening this week. Um, so any reminders that you know of anyone that needs to register a little one that will become a new community member at ASA, um, send those reminders out. Hopefully we see lots of folks. Um, we have our fourth and fifth graders participating in their first orchestra concert on March 21st with the rest of the district. So that will be exciting for all of them. 
We also have on March 26th, a curriculum or literacy night, um, which I know has been mentioned before, but it is very exciting. And the literacy team at ASA, along with all of the classroom teachers have been working hard to get ready for this night. The last time this was planned was for March of 2020. Um, so the staff is feeling really good about bringing this back and we're excited to hopefully see lots of families and folks in the building on that night. And then finally, we also have ACE students that are gonna be participating in the show choir extravaganza on March 29th. So it's gonna be pretty busy for um, the, the kiddos at ASA. Uh, the last thing that I just wanted to take a moment and talk about is that we have been working with our PTO um, to rethink through our current playground. The ASA play structure is more than 30 years old at this point, and there are components of it that um, are in disrepair. And unfortunately, as hard as Bill has been trying, there are parts of it that we just cannot um, get up and working again. We've had caution tape on parts of it for most of the school year. Um, so the PTO has been working um, to um, put together a proposal for a sizable donation to help us with a new play structure. Um, so uh, working with them, uh, Bill Cody and some, some of the staff at ASA were looking at what a new play structure could look like, estimating a cost for that. Um, Bill is also looking at, um, from the facility's point of view, the groundwork, um, if there needs to be um, different, um, a substrate or material under our play structures and drainage um, that would be more appropriate for that. Um, so hopefully by the end of um, this month, we will have some estimates and ideas of what a new play structure might look like um, for the students at ASA. So those were the only things I, I wanted to highlight tonight. And if you have any questions. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Thank you. We move on to the middle school, Richard. Good evening, everyone. Nice to see you all tonight. Um, I, I want to start with uh, a, 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 bit, a little bit of athletics here. And uh, thank you all for acknowledging uh, the success of our chess team this year. I, I wanted to point out they won the Penobscot Valley Middle League Championship. Uh, a couple of individuals were recognized, and I don't have my list right in front of me, and third place at the States. And uh, Coach Tripp, who's been at this a long time, uh, was nominated uh, coach of the year as well. So uh, nice job to coach Tripp on that. And uh, we're lucky to have him. He's such passionate about chess. Uh, I never saw anyone uh, as passionate about chess as, as he is. Um, <clears throat> our unified basketball team is in full action. Last week, they had a game against Setamocha, and today they're playing over at Hamden. And uh, so uh, that's a lot of fun uh, for those kids. And uh, so that season is in full thing. Full swing. Thanks for your support there with Unified Basketball. And uh, what, one collaboration that that I'm excited about is, uh, we, you know, we have the university in our back door, and and we've been doing some uh, collaboration with with uh, both men's and women's teams. And uh, UMaine football's been around uh, uh, recently. We we had a uh, WA ABI news story last week, and I shared the link there in uh, in the newsletter. And uh, UMaine's women athletes from a variety of different sports have also been coming over uh, and participating in our morning intramural uh, program and uh, uh, for girls and uh, Mr. Kirkpatrick to organize that. Thank you to him. And uh, so we're getting that kicked off and we're looking toward the future to bring in uh, some UMaine uh, teams to do a similar activity as we do with uh, uh, UMaine football. So that's kind of that's in the planning stage. But uh, so we got uh, that collaboration going on. Uh, last week, we had a great opportunity to uh, visit the Penobscot Theater on March 6th. My story is Glue Scobby, and we get to see uh, a Native American perspective. Uh, very important uh, as uh, it's, a, it's a different perspective uh, from the traditional uh, science perspective on uh, life on the river and, and how uh, we interact with nature and uh, and. Uh, the implications when we try to do things that uh, go against nature. So it was, a, it was a great story and a great learning experience. My story is Glue Scobby. If, uh, I think it's still playing. I, I highly recommend. Um, and uh, I wanted to really highlight today our work on uh, the student success plan. So I, I shared a link, and I don't know if you had a chance to look at it, but it has a, a lot of different graphs and, and different information uh, 
about our student body. And and so I just wanted to highlight quickly, it's a lot of information here and too much to go into in great detail, but uh, it really gives us a sense of who our students are and who our families are, you know, and, and what their background is. And so I, I found it very uh, informative in that regard, uh, the religious identity, for it, to highlight one example. Um, I was surprised in that, that we had uh, such a high percentage of students who either uh, are not religious or they don't or they don't know, or maybe they missed, they didn't understand some of the questions, but they identified as not religious or they didn't know. And and, and I think the numbers there showed, you know, a, a fairly high uh, percentage, I, I'm going to estimate, you know, more than 50% of our students fall into one of those two categories. That was, that was interesting. And, and if you look at world religions, we have, uh, if, if they're telling the truth, uh, most represented here in uh, in our population, and and that is uh, interesting and important for us to know. I think uh, other areas that that I thought were uh, uh, important to understand is uh, students who identified uh, people who support them with their academic growth and people who support them with their personal and emotional growth. We had you know a smaller number of students who uh, who didn't find uh, supports in those areas. And uh, so we're able to drill down, we're able to identify those students and kind of, you know, put our heads together and uh, ident try to figure out why that might be. And uh, th there were a certain number of uh, what I call nonsense answers uh, in the responses. Uh, uh, like, I, I think I highlighted in there, one student put my dog, like, it, like he put that same response in quite a few different answers, right? And uh, so, but we didn't have much of that. I think for the most part, students were uh, pretty honest and straight up with us. Um, but you know, you have to consider a little bit of that uh, nonsense answers uh, happen in there too. And lastly, the word clouds. I, I want to give credit to Mrs. White for uh, developing the word clouds on on uh, the last page. And these were uh, data that we weren't sure how to share. So the word clouds really do a nice job. And the bigger words uh, identify, like the, the most common responses are those bigger words, right? And uh, so you can kind of see how that how that plays out. And uh, but th but I thought that that was good work, and I wanted to acknowledge uh, Miss Deshane and Mrs. White for like helping me uh, develop these graphs and this nice infographic for us all, and uh, and the entire staff, you know, for reviewing and uh, uh, the data and providing feedback as we work through that. So, Great, thank you. Any questions? All right, the high school, Sam and Meredith. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you to all of you who have already highlighted a lot of successes that we've been experiencing here at the high school. Um, in our board report, I included more of those, including like the jazz band, some math team accolades recently, um, but there's just been a lot going on um, and we're really, really proud. Um, I know, I, I believe I, know that I speak for both Meredith and I, this is a really exciting time. And it's really proud to be a part of seeing our students succeed in ways in the classroom as they do every day, but also in ways um, in their extracurricular choices that really um, shows them and shows us where they shine additional to their ac academic um, accomplishments. So thank you to everybody and congratulations to all um, that are included in those lists. Um, but I'd also like to just um, make a specific shout out to Sherry Weeks, Recently, um, there was the um, week in which they honor um, the work that she does for our students. And we just are very, very fortunate to have her as our athletic trainer. Um, a lot of schools have great people that work with them and they all work really hard to keep students um, safe and healthy as they compete. But certainly Sherry Weeks is um, not only that person for them, but also a person that a lot of students look forward to seeing every day, turn to, to talk to. And as you'll notice, if when you're out at our athletic events, they, they're yelling to her, they're saying hello, and they each even, some even have like secret handshakes. So thank you so much, Sherry, for all that you do for our students um, every day. Really appreciate it. And I also wanted to make a quick um, thank you and appreciation uh, to those that helped with Step Up Day. Our recruitments ever this year have grown. Um, we're really looking at trying to really uh, show people what Orono High School is and what we have to offer them as students and their students, if they're families. 
Um, and really, we've had a lot of people supporting that from students in the ambassador programs to staff, um, to a, a group of people that were part of my recruitment committee, uh, guidance staff, Meredith Diamond, just everybody really pulling together to really try to show those out there uh, what makes us amazing. So I just wanted to say thanks to everybody. Those efforts continue. We do have um, a registration night coming up on the 27th and the guidance counselors are going back out to um, our um, outlying towns to really meet with students again and answer any questions and even maybe share some new programs that I believe Meredith is gonna share in a moment. Um, so those are exciting. And I also just wanted to share with everybody that it's Winter Carnival Week, which is crazy and exciting. Um, yesterday we had the, our annual staff for senior basketball game, which I tried to commentate for. Meredith did a wonderful job playing on the court. Um, but it was a lot of fun with students and, and every day this week is is dress up days finding little um, I don't know what they are I don't know if they're little gnomes or what they are really but these things that they can earn prizes for and then we have a wonderful dance um, on Thursday. Leprechauns, so, Sam. They're leprechauns. Oh, that actually makes a lot of sense. See, that's where I struggle sometimes. <laughs> there you go. Anyway, leprechauns. There's also worms around the school and I'm not quite sure what the worms are about. But anyway, um, but a lot of just a lot of fun stuff going on and just wanted to say thanks to everyone who's a part of all of that. Meredith. So today was actually Adam Sandler Day. And, um, you know, I think that when uh, board meetings fall on a, on Spirit Week, that it's not a bad idea for everyone to dress up in, in theme. So um, we'll be sure to keep you posted about that next year. Um, noted. <laughs> she really uh, <laughs> today. Uh, yeah. So, um, you know, as Sam said, this is, this is a really exciting time of year and there is, is so much going on. And um, one of the pieces that has been happening um, in, a, in a committed and um, thorough and detail-oriented way really behind the scenes is preparation for our upcoming NEAS accreditation visit. Um, those folks, as I mentioned, are going to be arriving uh, here on Sunday. They're staying at Hotel Ursa, um, which if you know, you have folks from out of town, um, seems to be uh, really like choice accommodations now in Orono, um, and they've been great to work with. Um, but uh, Jen Branchflower and Margie Innes, in an effort to protect professional development time for the important work that the district is doing, um, to protect that for uh, the faculty at large, have really taken this lift on, um, on their own. And it has um, it has taken a lot, a lot of hours, and those hours for them are, are going to, you know, be um, ongoing until the visit concludes next Wednesday. Um, but if your paths happen to cross um, Jen or Margie's in the near future, I encourage you to just recognize that to them because they are they are doing an incredible job, and um, they have through their commitment to seeing this process through have allowed for all of the other priorities that we have in the district to keep um, making forward progress throughout the rest of the year. And, you know, I think that that is the value of that is not to be understated. Um, the only other item I'm going to report on tonight is um, our upcoming uh, New Roots Shared Ground, a welcome home camp for rising Orono High School ninth graders, um, which we'll be running the week of August 5th. Um, here in Orno. And, you know, this is a project that um, is a an arm of the conversations that we've been having about ninth graders for, you know, at this point, probably approaching two years, you know, here in the high school that, you know, started around an observation that what students seem to need now is really not what we have historically given students. And, you know, how do we figure out what it, what else we could be doing, um, but it's also an outgrowth of our um, our DEI work and our equity audit. It's an outgrowth of the um, the work of the wellness committee. It is an outgrowth of the vision that has been taking shape on the strategic um, leadership planning team, and um, you know the priorities that have been set therein that really are reflective of you know the priorities of this community, and. Um, in, in that context and in that ecosystem, um, the project itself came together in the way that the state often demands, which is um, in a three to four week window where you have um, not a whole lot of time to think of something new, but have a chance to bring to bear an idea that you know coalesces a lot of things that have been happening um, in the background. 
And so um, the parameters of the funding were specific. Uh, it needed to be something that had an expenditure window that closed at the end of the summer. It needed to be something that was specifically targeted at um, disadvantaged students. And it needed to be something that maximized time outdoors. Um, and so the project as we have planned it is going to pull together um, rising ninth graders from our sending towns coupled with um, students in rising ninth graders from Orono Middle School who are identified as at risk. Um, and it is that the idea is that by um, bringing those students together for a week in the summer um, with ninth grade faculty um, wherever possible um, in the outdoors at the Caribou Bog Outdoor Learning Center, um, we hope to um, help lay the foundation for success as a community. We hope to um, create the kind of bonds that will help those students feel connected to one another before the school year starts. We hope to help them um, build connections with faculty with whom they'll be working, um, you know, in ninth grade and beyond in order to, you know, have relationships that can can fuel their success. And we hope in, we hope to um, involve families. Um, the, the plan uh, includes an end of end of camp um, celebration meal for students and their families. And, you know, in the spirit of our student and family welcoming committee, um, right, helping everybody feel like a part of this community. And, um, and then, you know, to have all of that unfold within the context of the Penobscot River Basin, um, with our connection to, um, you know, to Wabanaki land, um, you know, we have students, hopefully we'll have students from um, in the Indian Island School who will be joining us. Um, Jeff Owen and I had a had a great meeting with Angie Reed today to talk about how the Department of Natural Resources for the Penobscot Nation um, and specifically water resources can, can support this project and be a part of it. Um, and in the wake of that conversation, Jeff and Angie and I had the sense of uh, this potentially being um, the, the beginning of some really, really meaningful collaborations around um, student needs and um, and shared land and um, a blending of cultures that you know we have been talking about for a long time, but struggling to find you know a way a way to make happen. So um, we hope that this project will be the beginning. And that concludes my report for tonight. Great, thank you. Any questions or comments? Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, congratulations, and that sounds super exciting, and it you know pulls together many threads we've been talking about. So it's nice to see it materializing. So that's super exciting. Thank you, and I I do want to mention that you know this all of this all of the discussion about ninth grade really rests on the shoulders of Jeff Owen, uh, you know who is has been in this community a long time and is uh, you know has been a um, a visionary in this regard. And um, so similarly with with Jen and Margie, if if you happen to pass. Uh, or cross paths with Jeff, um, you know, please, please recognize that to him as well. Did you have something? Yeah, I guess I, just, I mean, yeah, it's, it sounds really, I'm really excited about that and hope, hope we can build on that, expand it in the future so we can all go. And it sounds, sounds wonderful, like really great that, really about that. I just also wanted to say like, reflecting on the ACE reports and all the reports, just a comment that like, um, you know, when, when I came here, it was like just after COVID and it, there was this sense of like disconnect between the community and the school and with all these events and things happening I've really felt the sense of like that connection really bonding like feeling more connected to parent teacher and school all these like the dance and things like that it just feels really really good I'm really like just thankful for the administrators and the teachers and folks who have been doing all this work to make this happen so. hey, anything else I guess also in the category of backing up, Richard, I just, I, I was busy taking notes, but I just wanted to pause and say that was really great to see the SSP report. I uh, really appreciated seeing that. And it was a, a really um, much deeper, well, broad brush picture, but uh, a much uh, more thorough and data-driven picture than I think I've ever seen. So uh, that, that was great. Thank you for that too. Sure. Anything else? All right, we'll move on to superintendent report. I have a resignation to report. Um, our MLL teacher, Rose Pompey, um, has notified us that she's accepted another position in another district. So she will be leaving mid-May. We've advertised the position in hopes to find someone to fill that um, by then. Um, 
I want to start with the ninth grade tu student tuition data. Mark asked for some data when we last met, and I think just taking a moment to look at it and talk about it, Lynn put this together and Lynn's on the um, meeting listening in while she's working at the desk. So let me just, I wanna share my screen so we're all looking at the same thing. Um, so this is as far back as um, could be, put together, you know, with the amount of effort I thought we wanted to put in at this point to look at this, but it's a, you know, seven year look back. And um, you can see that the percentage varies a lot um, from a low of 32% back in the fall of 2018 to a high the very next year of 51%. Um, and then last year was really our next lowest, or this current year actually is our next lowest year um, that we've had in these seven years. Um, well, we also observed it's not it's not listed here, and it's a harder thing for us to ascertain and, and have good data on is, is what was the base that year that we were trying to draw from. Um, and that's where we, you know, typically have set that percentage that we're um you know, feeling like we get around 30, low 30% of whatever the enrollment is in the area schools for any given year. Um, and I think, you know, around 2019, we really shifted some things about how we were doing recruitment and lots of planning and effort went into that. And we've really maintained that model with just a few tweaks since then. And the data has been really consistent at really until this year. Well, I guess in 2020, it went back down. So it was at a, at a high in 2019 and then back down 10 percentage points. So it's, you know, while the 41% in 2020 looks like a low number, when you look at how large the class is overall, it's really skewing that because we actually have 50 kids that year, which is, you know, the second highest number of students over these seven years. So, um, you know, this is a small class. The, actually, the last two years um, have been small ninth grade classes overall. Um, and the, you know, this year's ninth grade, really the, the tuition student number is a real contributing factor to that low number. Um, last year's number, we had, you know, more of a typical, I think, resident tuition um, population in the 2022 year. Um, so, you know, sometimes we have big groups and get big groups in, and sometimes we have small groups and get small groups in, and sometimes it's, you know, somewhere in between there. Um, as we said last time, it's, it's looking like this ninth grade year is going to shape up to be one of those we have. Really a, a, a typical size freshman class or eighth grade class coming out of Warner Middle School um, in the, I think, upper 40s and looks like a small tuition student pool. So um, we have the registration night in late March, have a better sense after that night um, what our tuition student um, registration is going to look like. Do you have any questions about this? Anything further you'd like to see on this? It's the budgeted number per, I'm recognizing we're conservative there, but FY25, the budget number. Lynn, how many freshmen did you build in? You can. Just trying to find a rescue button. Yeah, give me a second. I'm pulling that spreadsheet up right now. I'll get right back. Thank 20, you. 23 is what again? That's the 23 would be like the left column there. For this year, the ninth graduation student. 
for right. the coming year. I mean, typically it goes up a little from there because Lynn's conservative, but yeah, clearly, clearly a low number. Last year's we... summer turned out to be almost spot on, though, right, Lynn? Yes, we were uh, one shy from last year's number, but um, we're this year we're losing 30 seniors that are tuition and gaining and counting on 23 freshmen. So, so we're losing a big year and counting on a small year. A um, bit of a double whammy at both ends. But, you know, something that I talked to Meredith about is being conservative also helps us in a year like this one where we had quite a bit of movement of 10th through 12th grade. Um, whereas when we get it spot on, everyone that moves, you know, is a hit. So, um that's also something to think about, about that number is not only do we want to make sure we're going to get that number, but we want to give ourselves a little bit of wiggle room um, for the 10th or 12 kids leaving. So you changed things about recruitment in 19? And, I think that was the year. And was that, and I'm just trying to understand these patterns because it seems like there's on both the tuition and the overall, there's a slow up and down, but the percentage is sort of random. But like, it, and was that shift, do you think you've done the same thing ever since then? And it's been like, it wasn't like that, it looks like that year there was a big shift instantaneously, but then it. I mean, Sam Sam can speak to that. I, I, I feel like we have done the same general recruitment program since that time when we made some changes uh with some subtle you know subtle like one student group may have performed one year and the next year a different student group performs and yeah Sam, is there anything else that you would we add try to, to that? yeah we try to rotate through who performs um and some of it to be quite honest comes at what time um within the performance schedule um, for some of the groups. So for example, like one thing we want to try to work in if we can, um, but, but just have to be um, working with Jenna Costa is for modern band to perform. Um, but the way that the uh, our step up day falls at the beginning of the second semester, the first semester students are no longer in the class and the first semester kids are just starting. So we're going to, she's going to build in next year, for example, that the first semester kids will be told that they're going to perform. So they, even though their class is over, they'll be prepared to perform to show, um, you know, a class in which somebody like myself, who has very limited, if zero, our artistic ability could be able to take that class and learn and grow and have a great experience. Um, we do the same with, you know, orchestra versus a choir versus um, we've had the Wabanaki drum last year, whereas this year um, the orchestra was what welcomed them when they came in. Um, so we do try to change it up and give some variety to it, um, as well as we make a little adjustments throughout the overall experience for them based on feedback and current students and what we have going on in the school. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm just trying to read if there's some like bump from some novelty thing that happened in the night year and then it sort of wore off or something but like maybe it's just COVID. It's not, well so. it's um student enrollment really is very driven by cohorts and trends in a school if certain key students who are pretty um, influential on friends decisions make an early decision and are committed to a place you know sometimes lots of students follow that trend um, and some years that helps us and some years that, you know, hurts our recruitment efforts. I know that some groups like, you know, there was a big group of students who had participated with us coming up in youth athletics um, who are in the current junior and senior class that I think athletics kind of fostered their relationships here coming up through youth programs and they made decisions to come here. Not everyone did, certainly, that was in that in that group. And those youth programs aren't fully what they were then. I think um, the football program specifically kind of has trickled off the way. Marissa, did you have a... Um, we have to factor in other people's recruitment plans as well. Uh, when uh, years when a different school uses like a fire element in their ninth grade year can have different draws. I'll tell you about it later. <laughs> yeah. I mean, my my take is the total number of students to recruit 
there's some pattern and it ties to whether there was a recession 14 years prior and some things like that. And that number goes up and down, but the success of the recruitment, um, you know, like Meredith was saying, this is recruiting 14 year olds who are well known to be social and potentially fickle in what their priorities are, right? And, you know, the, the group influencer in Glenburn one year goes to Arno because their older brother or sister went to Arno or their parents went to Arno. And the next year, the group influencer in Glenburn goes to Bangor because their parents or older brother or sister went to Bangor. And it, it can be very clumpy and, um, you know, big swing because of, I think, the social dynamics of this. And it's really unfortunate for us because this is an important contributor to tuition. But I, I kind of get left at sports metaphors about you know, we have to give it our best shot and leave everything on the floor and those kinds of things, but we don't have total control over the outcome. And I, I, I have confidence that we're doing, leaving everything on the floor and we're just, you know, until I see several years of data, I'd have a pretty hard time saying there's anything actually under our control on this. One school, though, that we are, by all accounts, losing students to on a relatively consistent basis over the last few years is handy. I mean, that, there's no doubt about that. I mean, we were losing kids to Hamlin Academy at a higher level than we were five years ago. And so I don't know if that's you know, still a relatively new facility um, with great outdoor um, facilities, bigger school. I don't know why that is, but that's one a place where we're consistently losing out. <clears throat> Two other things that I think about when I look at the spreadsheet, the one thing that it doesn't show, that percentage is just the percentage of ninth graders that are tuition, but it's really hard to tell what the percentage of kids that were available that we got were, um, which is, that is really would be more tied to recruitment than, than just the percentage that's tuition opposed to the total enrollment so that that number isn't there part of the league because we don't have that information but the other factor I'm actually, that i'm actually working on pulling that information um, i had a conversation with susan today and she suggested i go to the essa dashboard to pull student numbers from you know the different classes um, and so my hope is to be able to provide that um, soon because the fluctuations are so significant like you know, the fluctuation in Indian Island can go from three students to 11 in one year. The fluctuation in VZ can go from 10 to 25. And to Lynn's point, you know, it's really more about, I think, the percentage of, of rising ninth graders that we are getting. Um, and that that's the figure that intrigues me. Right. And the other factor that I had mentioned to Meredith is some of those bigger classes, like our junior class, had a ton of um, superintendent's agreements in the middle school. So they just naturally came here and we have less of those right now. So um, that's also a factor when we can, when we're able to, obviously we have limiting factors, but when we're able to take superintendents agreements, then they they come into our system early, they tend to stay with us. So there, there some of those years are, had really nothing to do with recruiting and all about kids that were already here. So um that's Many just of those superintendents' agreements were specifically new sports in that particular class. So yeah, and that... others, I mean, I could think of a number of reasons. Like one is things in RC 34 changed a bit over those years. They used to allow superintendent agreement, or they used to allow tuition, and then they changed. You had to go another route, so it's more restrictive. So there are a number of factors, but that yeah, was... this last this last freshman class had a big group too, and I don't think it was athletics on that. In that case, it was just um, they were just here. Um, right, we have a reasonably longish meeting, so I don't want to cut anybody off, but uh, just want to keep people's eyes on the total agenda too. Anything else? Say one other thing. I was at a, a regional superintendent's meeting last week, and. Um, I, there were some, some of us talking about tuition students and um, the Glenburn superintendent said that their fresh, their eighth grade class this year, which is a smaller class compared to previous Glenburn classes, is one of the largest classes they have now. They've seen a, a real enrollment dip in their community. And so that being one of our largest 
sending towns, I think yeah. for the foreseeable future has lower overall enrollment. And um, as Meredith said, you know, some of the smaller community uh, like VZ and Indian Island have just real swings. So it'll be um, interesting if we do, um, did I mention about the regional um, enrollment study we're talking about with Pankless? I, I think I mentioned the UTC meeting, Kevin. That's yeah. you <laughs> I remember. Um, we're talking at Pankless about doing a regional enrollment study. Um, that will help all of us in a number of fronts. And it will be really interesting for us to use that to see what is our, what do our base tuition towns, you know, look like right now and what are they forecasting, forecasting to look like. Everybody, I guess move on is back to you, Meredith. Is everybody ready to move on? Um, the next thing is the UTC 910 satellite program. I think uh, last school year, it, Old Town opened the first regional ninth and tenth grade satellite program in our in our UTC region. Um, it's something that the state um, was encouraging youth, um, vocational technical centers to to do to expand the reach of CTE in a way that. Um, maybe utilize spare capacity at sending towns without having to build more space at technical centers and drew in students in a more um, kind of embedded part of their school day into experiencing what CTE might be like. And so there were, there were funds dedicated to this initiative at the state to develop this programming and basically it works a lot like a, an elective uh, wheel does in middle school. So in middle school, for example, we have an elective wheel in sixth grade and students rotate through on a trimester basis or a quarter basis, however it's structured each year to different topics. And that's how the satellite programs work. It, there are usually four um, programmatic topics selected that tie into CTE programs that give students an introduction to that programmatic topic. And so um, when we heard about this last year, late in the year, Meredith um, and I approached Amanda Peterson at UTC to say, you know, we'd like to, we'd like to get on the list to be considered to be able to offer one of these programs. And um, our kind of place in line would have put us eligible for the 25-26 school year. Um, well, one of the schools that was slated to start a program for 24-25 dropped out, <clears throat> for a variety of reasons. But Amanda contacted us and said, you're next in line, can you, do you think you would be able to work with us to stand up a program next year at Orono High School? Um, and so Meredith had a couple of meetings with Amanda. She had a meeting with the guidance staff and Sam and myself just to talk about um possibilities and what we see as maybe the the areas to pursue as um I, as a school you get to choose the four areas pretty much that you want to offer in your program and so um really in doing that you consider your population and what counselors and the principals are hearing from students about interest or what they know about the student population in terms of um maybe what would be interesting to them. And then UTC um, designs a program around that and finds an, an instructor to provide programming and some um, entry level kind of usually some kind of certification or, or um, like micro credentialing for those programs. Um, in terms of how it's funded, um, UTC through the um, state, through their state funding and through their um, kind of entitlement grants for CTE pays for the instructor, um, employs the instructor, kind of like J in a JMG model where they work at our school, but they're employed by this other organization. So they'd be employed by UTC and um, provides all of the equipment and supplies needed for the program in perpetuity. Um, 
the school's responsibility really is to, you know, find a space and support students' enrollment in the program. Um, and so we, you know, are in really beginning phases of thinking about how we can do this, but it has to move pretty quickly. So we wanted to bring this to you all just to, you know, fill you in and let you know this is something that, um, we'd like to pursue and see if you have any feedback or questions. And Meredith has a little more information that she can share about the um, the topics that we're looking at probably being the four topics for the program and anything she feels like I left out that would be helpful to bring up Meredith. Um, so the, I, I want to acknowledge um, our school counseling staff and their role in this. Holly Gunn has been participating in the weekly um, get to know UTC programming that is offered on site to educators regionally who want a, a, a an evening long dive into the different programs. And, um, you know, while she's participating in that, she's having conversations with students um, in ninth grade in particular, um, with whom she has or about whom she has concerns if those students aren't able to latch into something that feels engaging and relevant to them um, before 11th grade, which is typically when um, CTE programming becomes available to students. And so in our conversations um, with school counseling staff and with um, um, UTC uh, staff about the uh, our enrollment trends, we identified um, four programs that um, right now are the, are the leads in terms of a proposal for who, what we would offer. Um, and those programs are carpentry, small, small engines, emergency medical responder, and culinary. Um, and the hope is that though that collection of programs, um, one serves as a gateway to other UTC programming. Um, carpentry, it was explained to me, is a, is a program that, um, well, I'll back up. The, the, the frame for um, the exploratory program is that students receive instruction in 25% of the foundational skills in each of the programs that are offered. Um, so 25, the, the, the first 25% of, of instruction in carpentry um, is in skills that translate across many other programs. Um, so if a student is learning that first 25% of carpentry, then they're also set up really well to go into plumbing. They're also set up really well to go into electrical. And so carpentry has sort of like a launch program um, for students who, who would want to pursue, um, you know, other programming or carpentry for students who um, would be really loving their um, their shop class, you know, if it were 1995, but, you know, to whom that class just isn't available anymore. Um, small engines, similarly, um, you know, it can be uh, offered on a scale that is totally doable within a, a non-industrial um, space, but then would also translate to uh, many of UTC's other programs. Um, emergency medical responder is a program that um, comes with a certificate that um, that qualifies the the holder as a um, a first responder on a job site that is recognized across many industries. So um, not only is it a way to you know kind of dip your toes in um, a like a health occupations context, but if you do end up becoming um, you know, somebody who pursues a, a diesel equipment um, line of work, um, you bring with you the added benefit of being um, licensed as a, as a first responder on the job site. And then finally, culinary as um, a as an avenue that is of interest to some of our students as, as a profession and as a trade, but then also um, lives potentially in that realm of real world skills that um, came up so frequently in the surveys around our strategic plan. Um, you know, and we acknowledge that uh, people probably mean different things when they're talking about real world skills, but culinary as as one of them that, you know, could prepare our students to um, make themselves a meal from um, Hannaford versus um, McDonald's. So um, our hope is that offering that that combination of four programs will appeal to students who um, are, are going to be heading into two years of UTC as soon as they hit 11th grade and are holding their breath otherwise until they get there. But that also would appeal to students who are just interested in, in learning about um, the, the applicability of those skills to their life, no matter what their um, career path ends up being. The, the framework for instruction is that um, the instructor hired would offer um, a discrete period, just like other folks in the building in terms of, um, you know, teaching three out of four blocks each day. 
class size would range from eight to 12 students in each of those. And so we're talking about a sizable portion of the, the OHS population who would be able to access this programming um, as an elective offering. Uh, UTC is really excited about the fact that we offer technical math. Um, that is a, a math class that um, many of the students who are on site at UTC often uh, take in, in fulfillment of their requirements for either uh, an associate's degree through EMCC or through one of the pathways programs to one of the state universities. Um, and they are excited about the fact that we have an instructor on site who's teaching that who may be willing to collaborate on you know, some of the, the mathematical units um, in, a, in a way that is, um, we're hoping will help break down some of those uh, discipline barriers in between content areas and um, create a context for a feeling of relevance that transcends the student's time in the, in the exploratory class and that, that touches all part of their work here. Sounds great. Questions or comments? So if I'm hearing this correctly, we could potentially have, would it be four different instructors from UTC or do they cross? No, that's a really good question. It's something that I just didn't understand how it works. It's one instructor and really they support that instructor with uh, support from their instructors at UTC to either provide training or materials to lead into that foundational training. So they really have to be you know, open to, they have to be certifiable in one of the four areas but um, they're looking for people who have enough skills to pick up instructional responsibility for all four. I mean, it's just a small engine to culinary is like a- Right, I know, we've said that, and, and they said, right. that we'll-, we'll But that it. being said, it's introduction in each one of right. them, so it's- yeah. Yeah. One of the justifications for the emergency medical responder as one of the programs was that that's a um, that's a ready-made curriculum um, that was developed by a third party that can be you know delivered by an instructor who isn't necessarily um, having to build their own. And so you know UTC is is one of the regional centers that is running these programs, and you know there are other parts of the state where they reach down into middle school. And so the the model is is filling out in terms of you know how to make all of these programs within reach of the instructor who's um, in many <clears throat> cases only industry experienced in one of the four areas. Do you have the space for this? We're currently exploring space options. So we think we can come up with creative. Mind if one space? Is that like one Sorry? space? And if, if we do, would it be one space for all? Like this person would have one classroom all day? Um, We're still exploring. We don't have an answer for that. We're Along Jake's lines, I don't know if you could do culinary and small engine. Yeah, space. and they've said that culinary is not, it's like, we're not going to be able to do, we're not going to have a full kitchen. And and she says that's okay, that they can design some programming that's, you know, using, you know, very, you know, portable kind of culinary. I don't, I don't know what exactly that means, but she was not... I mean, you know, induction burners for like 60 or 80 bucks a piece, and right. they can do a lot with a single one, but induction burner. Right. Just you know? that kind of like hot plate. Just when we thought we were getting ready to rock, this one's making. No. <laughs> so it, seemed, it seems like you think you'll be able to come up with this. But... Yeah, we, we have some options we're exploring right now. So when we have more info, we'll be happy to share that. We just don't have answers to provide that right now. So like in the last strategic plan, we were like, you have some thoughts about a way to like do something like this. Did you know this was gonna happen? Uh, no, actually, yeah. this has been very like surprised that we were, our number was called to say, hey, come on down. And both sounds like we were called a year early, right? We were, yeah. And so wait, can you write, so does this something that we continue or? Just... Yes, and I asked that question, is this just, you know, as long as grant funds, um, allow and she said no it's it's built into our state sub subsidy for the staffing costs and um, the equipment costs it you know there's usually a, a outlay at the beginning to outfit a program that's more significant and then they would use budget funds to replenish you know supply needs from year to year so it's you know a way for the for the state and, and our region to promote CTE programming for students to really keep it in their 
you know, build a vision and keep them motivated to do well enough in their classes so they're eligible to go to UTC and give them an idea of what UTC can offer them. So I think it's a smart model to to utilize and it's a win-win for us, right? To to get these really, I think, engaging electives for almost no cost for our students. I think it's awesome. Are we are we locked into those four in perpetuity or is there yeah, a way to change? I don't think we're locked in. No, we're not locked in. It would just be a matter of um I mean the, the idea is is to offer the students what they want. Um and so the as long as the um as long as the faculty who is brought on board uh, you know, if that faculty is is the right person for the role, then it would be a matter of adjusting within their um, their zone of of licensure and you know ability to develop new programming. Uh, but no, we're not we're not locked in anywhere. And licensure for this, I it is very flexible um, for CTE folks. There there are some really flexible certification pathways for people who have just industry experience to bring into these roles. Cool. Yeah, yeah I, I'd like to, yeah, I'm also super supportive. Of course, I'm really excited this is happening. Uh, I think it ties in nicely to the future conversation about the board report, like meeting students where they're at, providing alternative pathways for students to demonstrate excellence and interests that are on a, the, you know, the typical path of AP or honors or whatever. So, and then allowing your know, students that might not find you know traditional classroom um, education as engaging, so that they don't seem as promising in those traditional sort of assessment um, week means. And if they're not doing well as a ninth and 10th grader, they're not gonna qualify for UTC in their 11th, 11th grade. So if they can shine in that ninth and 10th grade, they get access to the full UTC experience, which is you know really remarkable. So it's a, it's a wonderful set of doors and I'm so appreciative of Meredith and Meredith and, and, um, uh, and uh, Holly God and you know, for, for, for jumping on this opportunity and for promoting it. I don't take the credit. I know. Interesting. <laughs> you can cook on small engines. There's some, some great TikToks of people, you know, the manifold. Yeah. You know. <laughs> so there, there's crossovers there, some tinfoil and saying. <laughs> so do you need anything for me? No. Um, and I asked, there's not an MOU that we sign. Um, it's just looking for, you know, your support, and I assume that we would have that support. I just wanted to give you a chance to weigh in if you had any concerns or questions. Entire and unanimous and enthusiastic in the support. So, um, last thing, just just a reminder that our um, next board meeting will be uh, really focused on budget. You know, a lot we're bringing back information next meeting, and it's next Wednesday. It's on an odd night, so I just want to put another reminder in your brain about that. Same time. Same time. Thank That's you. all. Okay. Uh, next up, board survey. So just to set the stage for people who don't know, um, we've been, gosh, five, seven years now, we've had a practice of 360 surveys. 360 being, you know, the degrees of a compass, everybody above and below. And we do a 360 survey typically in February of the board, a self-evaluation for the board. Uh, we do a 360 for the superintendent typically in March and then 360s for the principals and school climate in April. Uh, and we are not going to do this tonight, but there's typically the board survey is followed up by a board self-evaluation, which we'll probably do in, a, in about a month or so. Um, we did not participate in the board survey, so we'll do our own self-reflection in public. So uh, it was open for, I think, three or four weeks. We got uh, 40, 40 odd, 45, I think, respondents, about half community, half teachers, uh, some administrators and other things, but I lumped them into those two groups, community and staff, to uh, you know preserve some anonymity. Um, it's, that's about the same level of response we've had the last couple of years. So the response rate, you know, whether that's good or bad response rate, you can have an opinion, but especially with the staff, I appreciate that this, you know, this is not a required activity. It's a volunteer activity. So I appreciate their participating. Uh, you guys all got the summary results yesterday and I asked you all to reflect on them and anybody uh, who wants to can share some thoughts. 
Uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and start out. Uh, the response from the parents was, I think, pretty typical of what we've seen. Most of the parents are reasonably happy, you know. So just for people's information, this is a scale of one to seven. One is very unhappy, seven is very happy. Most of the parents are, you know, five to six. There were a handful of parents that were ones and twos, and that also is typical in a given year. Somebody who unfortunately had a bad experience uh, of some aspect of our schools and is letting us know about that. Obviously, this is not a random sample. This is a selective sample, and uh, people with strong opinions, and strong opinions are most often negative, are the ones most likely to participate. I don't say that to discount, but you know, we look at those uh, strong negative opinions to see if there's anything we can do to address it. Um, as far as the comments, I think the one unifying comment across many parents, I think five or six people commented on this in some detail, was the do we stretch all students or challenge all students, uh, right? One of our three core values was meeting every student where they're at and move them forward. And there was a pretty strong response from parents about, no, we're still not doing this, or you're finally starting to do it. Thank goodness, please do it more and faster, right? So there's a pretty enthusiastic effort at the same time of uh, the acceleration efforts, at the same time, there was some uh, perception that we're still not uh, picking that box for at least one group of students. Teachers uh, <clears throat> were a <laughs> pretty notably strong opinion. Uh, teachers have always had a lower opinion of the board than parents. That's probably structural. Uh, but the, the teachers this year were extremely unhappy and expressed that voluminously. Uh, there were there were teachers in different places, and that may map the teachers in different schools. Some some teachers were quite happy, sixes or fives and sevens, and uh, expressed appreciation for things the board were doing. But if I'm to accurately reflect the overall teacher gestalt, and again, we didn't ask about schools, so I could speculate that these vary across schools, but I don't know that. Um, there were a lot of ones and twos, more ones and twos than we've ever gotten as a board before and since we've been doing this, which is six or seven I think 2017 might have been the first year we did this. So eight years of surveys. Um, but I just want to say that out loud. Noted, heard the teachers are very unhappy with what the board is doing. Um, or staff. Or staff, yeah, right. Yeah, there, there were staff members and administrators in there too. So collectively staff is very unhappy with what the board is doing. Um, in terms of why that is and what we could do to change that, it was less clear. Um, there were several things that I've mentioned. I'm just going to try and tick them off to show that I've heard them. Uh, and, you know, maybe in some cases, a little bit of a response. Uh, there were a number of comments about we don't hear what's being said in the surveys, right? So there's some anger about the survey process itself. I guess I just have to draw a distinction between hearing and doing what we hear, right? Just because somebody asked for something in a survey doesn't mean the board is necessarily going to be able to do that. Uh, most fundamentally, we almost always get contradictory opinions in these surveys. Some people want this, some people don't want this. Right? A good example is actually, if you look at the comments, the parents really wanted more acceleration and the teachers wanted less acceleration, right? So somebody's always going to be unhappy. But I just want to draw a distinction between hearing and doing. Uh, I, I would pretty categorically reject that we don't hear. I think, it, you know, consistently, at least four, if not five board members have read every single comment and have thought and reflected about them when we take the time to publicly share. We can't go through every comment, but we do take time to, to go through things. So uh, I do think we hear, uh, we don't always agree and we can't always do what's being said, but we do hear uh, and we do appreciate the time put into feedback. Pay was mentioned. Um, I'm just gonna say, if you're talking about the contracts we had a year or two ago, you're right. I think those contracts stunk, we were, had three-year contracts and inflation went crazy in a way that nobody, neither us nor the union anticipated. And we were we were out of sync with the marketplace. Um, that said, we have a new teacher contract in place and we're working on a new uh, EPS support staff contract. And once that contract signed, I would like to have that conversation again. I, I, by and large, would like to always be in a place where we're very competitive with the districts around us and offer a competitive salary. And that's, that's our, Target point, and I think after this new contract gets signed, I'd like to make the argument. And again, taking into account the total contract, right, pay and benefits, you know, you could go to industry, 
uh, who might pay you more a dollar more an hour because you know benefits or something. The total package, I would I would be happy to have the conversation with anybody again with the new contracts, acknowledging the problem with the old contracts. Um, we hear this every year, but it came out a little more, and I've never addressed it before, but it came out a little more strongly this year. So a lot of people are saying, well, the board shouldn't really have anything to do with education. You don't have education degrees. You shouldn't be talking about what's happening with education. They make a couple points. Um, first off, you know, it's just not realistic that teachers are going to be left to do exactly whatever they want to do, right? Everybody has a boss, everybody has accountability, and uh, that's just how the world works. I, I'd love to have a job where I get a guaranteed salary and don't have to be accountable to anybody, but that doesn't exist. But more importantly, and this is a little philosophical, I'd like to back up and point out that um, the community pays for the schools, right? The taxpayers, the citizens pay for the schools. And the taxpayers and the citizens expect to have some input. They don't want to walk into your classroom and, you know, say Sally should be teaching X and Joe shouldn't be using book Y, but uh, they want to have some big picture input about the values and priorities that are going into a school. And that is the way school schooling in America is structured. You can go to Florida or Texas where it's structured through the State Department of Education and the legislature. You can go to New England where it's structured through local school boards. But People pay for the schools and people expect to have some pay about what's happening in the schools, and that's not going to change. That said, I would like to point out, I think we have a much more uh, collaborative uh, context and structure here in this district than you can find in many districts. Starting with, you know, we the board has, the board and really central administration has very little uh, desire to get into the details of what's happening in classrooms. And I know you all know there are districts nearby where there's still pacing. Not just every classroom in the third grade is on the same textbook, but they're on the same page of the same textbook. So, you know, we're, we're, that's not something, that's not the order way. We're not contemplating that. And uh, the board continues to offer, the board's vision has always been collaborative, right? We don't think, uh, we don't think, uh, we know that things are not going to get anywhere without the teachers, but we think the teachers, you know, benefit from having input and feedback and ideas too. And it's it's always the goal has always been collaboration. We have these multi-stakeholder groups, even things that are strictly board like policy are open. And we've had teachers drop in, we've had parents drop in at policy committee meetings, and that's actually not, and not just drop in and watch through public meetings, but uh, comment and participate. That's not an opportunity that you have in that many districts. So. You know, the, there's a vision that's collaborative, but there's not a vision. The board's just disappearing and handing over a check. So uh, that's 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 how it is. That's not going to change. Um, there were a few comments about personnel. I'm just going to point out that's against the law for us to be talking about personnel in a public forum. Just remind the board of that, too. So I'm not going to address any personnel comments. There were a number of comments about uh, academic changes that have been implemented, and I'm not going to hash through all those in detail. And most of those, in fact, I think all of those that I saw commented didn't come from the board, but uh, the ones I'm aware of, I'm strongly supportive of. So that is what I heard. Those are some of my thoughts about what I'd heard. I'd like to stop. I've, I've talked for a bit. I'd like to let my colleagues uh, share any of the reflections they had on hearing what you know, our 360 community had to say. So <clears throat> I don't want to repeat anything you said I for the for the staff um, survey. I had four things I wrote down. You actually mentioned three of them. The one you didn't mention, though, that I kind of picked up on is there was almost a, well, there was a theme, at least to me, of students not being held accountable. Um, <clears throat> that kind of jumped out to me as something that wasn't mentioned. Um, and then with the community one, um, you know, I really just wrote down two themes. You kind of hit on both of them. Um, students not being challenged probably more in a specific building than another building. And then the board not listening to others, but you can address that as well. Um, do you know, one thing you didn't mention, um, obviously my understanding is that the employee response rate is better than the community response rate. Do you know what the response rate rates are roughly? I mean, I imagine they're in single digits, right? Uh, yeah, so total 20, 20 out of 100 is like a 
20% response rate per no, staff. 160. 160 with, uh, with it. I mean, probably the rate was much higher among teachers than among right. support but staff. Right, staff but, overall, we have about 116, 20. Right, so 12%. Percent. And then obviously total community, community is two and a half percent. Yeah. Which I would consider primarily parents. Obviously, yeah, right. That would be what we two and a half percent of parents if we included all taxpayers would yeah. be a much right, but it doesn't go out to yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh compared to our other surveys, the board survey gets less interest than the superintendent or DEI surveys, but not you know, not the strategic plan survey is the one that's actually gotten the highest feedback with several hundred. Uh, but uh, this is the one that gets the least feedback, which that's probably appropriate, but the board does is a little um, abstract and aloof, especially probably to parents. But um, yeah. Other things, Jake? Yeah. Anybody else? Hey, thanks. Um, let's see. Uh, I guess you know, on the commute, Community, the, the, like you're you're saying, they're worried about students being left behind. There's a little bit too of like, or, or students, yeah. Like I think there was some concern on the other in terms of the uh, if students are accelerated, what that does to the other the students that are left behind. I guess there was that sort of concern about acceleration being bad. I guess and maybe that was more in the staff, but uh, and so I saw that, um, and a little bit of that concern sort of I felt like connected to sort of the the growth mindset not being in middle school classes they pointed out in particular maybe more um and i feel like that i'm hoping with sort of the strategic plan works with like active learning and, and we'll be addressing some of that kind of like moving towards more less like there were, i think there were several comments on like worksheets and things moving towards more hopefully we can steer things a little bit to address some of those problems um i guess uh I, I one thing, Ryan, I, I it's really great that you print these out. It's really like helpful to see it all. Could, is it possible in the future to like make like add like the row number for the individual comments in from the data frame? Because some there's like these comments that repeat throughout. I don't know. I think it's the same person in multiple places, but I'm not ever hundred percent sure if it's multiple people. So like maybe we could just see, oh yeah, that's row number, whatever you're saying. Yeah, yeah, sometimes they refer to see my comment as well, but so I had a little trouble discerning whether it was the same person over and over again or like it's well, definitely a case of somebody's crumb that you're gonna see yeah, the so same comment. Just, like put print the data with the row. Yeah, I could I had, that's yeah. a good idea. I mean I, yeah. I hesitate I have a spreadsheet. I could give you the spreadsheet, but yeah, that's a hard thing to digest. But maybe just the row numbers. Yeah, yeah, that's right? helpful. So um, parent number six. Yeah. <laughs> parent number six always because there's a few there's some like some of those there's some, someone who seems to hate one of us a lot. <laughs> Um, I guess the other things it's like I it, it seems some of these comments too were like from the teachers. It seemed like saying that the board is irrelevant, like we're not we're not really affecting anything, it's really the ministry doing things. And on the other hand, we're all too powerful and we're like affecting too much. And so I'm sort of like not sure how we hold both of those. Um and I guess the other thing is you know, there was a lot of the sense that, like, well, like, for instance, there's the thing about phones that I don't understand what that means. Um, but there are a number of, I, like, I've said in the past a lot that I feel like, like, I really don't understand what's happening in the schools and the teachers. And I think some of that was like, the board doesn't know what's happening. And I guess there's part of me that, like, I don't know, I really want to feel more connected and know more. So, like, I had this thought, which is, it would be fun to just go sit in the school someday, just me and in the class. Maybe hey, like each we could take turns and people could just come by and talk to us or something. Like some way to like, you know, because I know we're not supposed to like go out and like talk to teachers because we have authority and stuff. But like if there was a way for me or anyone to like sit for the day and work and people wanted to come chat informally, I would love to get to know the school and the teachers and the community more because I do feel disconnected. And so like I'd love more opportunities to just informally like because I know I mean, ASA is somewhat, but like middle school, high school, not so much. So, like, I, don't know, I love that idea or something where it's like outside of these sort of formal, scary processes, just kind of getting to understand the pulse of things better. I, I feel like that would help and that me to do some of this or something. Um, so, I think, I think those are the things I was noticing. And, like, yeah, and I don't know where, where a lot of these comments are coming from. 
speak about like our responses to people because it's not like there's many people ever watching <laughs> or anything. so i'm not sure if the if the like our the antithesis toward the board and board members comes from these meetings or from policies like committees or other interactions and so i'm not sure like what and some of them may be secondhand yeah right i mean i can tell yeah. you one thing that was attributed to a person in there never happened. Okay. Right. So, um, so I'm sorry. No, so what helped, like when I read these, I look for themes. Yeah. Like things that come up over and over and over again, not necessarily the one offs. Yeah. Um, you know, that's true. And on your, well, way back, I do think the teachers and the parents were in totally different places on acceleration. I think those comments were almost perfectly separated by category. Okay. Yeah. Um, and to your point about the kind of drop-in, we've tried that before. And actually, I think the suggestion came from Shauna. And so when they were doing the kind of rotation PD, right, or mini, mini academy where you could go to any of six events, we had an event where we had board members. First time we did it, we had 20 people show up, teachers and staff show up, and it was a really good conversation. And so we said, well, we should do that again. We did it next year. And one person showed up, and I think she actually wanted to leave and go to another one, but she felt bad for us. So Mark was at both of the end. He remembers. Well, and maybe maybe it could be less formal. Maybe it could just be like every once in a while, one of us is there in in the building or something at a time. Of, I don't know. I, I don't. Maybe yeah, we're worth, worth continuing to think. I mean, about. I'm because I wasn't there for that. So I, I would welcome any ideas for how to do that. Anybody else? I guess the one thing I would I would say that's a little bit different from what's and I agree with everything so far. So the one thing I would add that's maybe a little bit different is to me, um, yeah, certainly certainly staff is a little um less pleased than normal. They're never super pleased with us, but they're maybe less super pleased than, than most years. So um I don't think that that didn't surprise me. Um on the other hand the community satisfaction was a little bit lower. Um it seems that and then it's been in recent years and you know, really, when you go and compare the needs, they're, they're really not all that different, um, except for one category. There's a pretty big gap between community and staff, but for the most part, the needs are, are pretty close. That being said, what they're unhappy or happy about tends to be quite different, right? And in some cases, diametrically opposed to each other, you know, so you'll have community unhappiness about this, whereas, you know, staff would want more of this and vice versa. So I, how you reconcile that um, is, a, is a difficult question. I think it's one worth thinking about, but it also points, it also points out the fact that the board has a lot of different audiences and um, different groups that, it, that it should strive to be accountable to. So. I guess it's Briefly adding on to that, uh, the theme that I noticed was, or you know, trying to find a theme, something consistent, was uh, something I around communication. So it might be that folks don't feel like they have an understanding of what the board is doing, which I sympathize to. I never watched board meetings before becoming a board member. Um, school runs pretty well. Wasn't super worried about it. And you know, uh, attending a two, three, four hour meeting is a pretty tough haul for, for anybody after working the day or having, having kids. So I know we've tossed this ball around, but I wanna keep tossing around some way of uh, connecting with the community. There were some responses about you know that tension between wanting to know more, but also not having the bandwidth for a newsletter. And I know we have these uh, amazing uh, student board reps. Um, and I was thinking about how they're, they're nicely positioned one, um, they'll always be new, right? Um, never more than two years. So they'll always have a fresh set of eyes. Um, and, I, and I wonder if there's some potential there for being sort of an outsider, insider, being able to kind of capture ideas or think of novel ways of connecting with the community. Or um, So that was something I took away was, you know, maybe not, not knowing how to know more or, or wanting to know more, but not wanting to <laughs> watch, watch me, me talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Thank you for participating. All, all, everyone, you know, out there or wherever that participated. Yeah, I mean, that was a question we asked about how would you like to connect, and it was kind of, uh, as expected, kind of frustratingly all over the place. Some people want to 
uh, you know, podcasts or emails or there were a couple of low-hanging fruit. There was a suggestion that you could subscribe to a list where you would get the minutes emailed to you. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. and I don't know how much work that would be to set up, but um, if we could get that in an automated format, that might be some people, me among them, prefer to digest information visually rather than auditorially. Right. And that's a nice compress, especially as we were coming earlier. Rachel does a very good job. So, um, yeah. you know, I don't know how hard setting up the automated video mail list, but the minutes are probably a pretty concrete way of communicating information. And we've tried having like a board corner in the superintendent's newsletter. We could go back to that perhaps too. But I think it's aforementioned that people don't read. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. Um, Anybody else have more thoughts? I just wanted to say, like on the graphs, like the one thing that kind of looks most concerning to me is the, the learning mindset among the community. Like the, the big six, the bar, the, the number one, like worst score, highest bar. That seems like the graph that to me looks like a lot of people just have. Yeah, I'm just losing battery here, but I'm um, going to step back a little bit philosophically and long-term trajectory. You know, I think the survey, I don't think we ran a survey in 2020 if memory serves with COVID, but um, 2021, 2022, it was clear to us that there was um, an increased level of dissatisfaction. Uh, again, probably more in the staff than the parents, but um, I don't know if any of us knew what to do. It was kind of like, well, uh, COVID, you know, everybody's burned out. COVID's been tough. What's what's not to invalidate that that was real, but it existed, but um, we didn't know what to do about it. And I feel like, you know, as, as we've gotten further and further from COVID and things have gotten theoretically better and better, actually people's attitudes or feelings or impressions have gotten worse and worse and worse, right? Uh, at least as marked by the survey. And, and I think in some level of conversation that I hear around the community too, uh, at the, in particular in the buildings with the staff. Um, so I, I think it's kind of reaching a point where we need to step back and say, okay, it's not just COVID. It's not gonna just fade away as COVID fades away. Not that COVID's ever going to fade away, right? And I know people are in different places on how far we are in that. I don't want to rekindle that debate, although that is two agenda items away. Uh, but I think it's time to start having a conversation about, okay, this is the new normal, right? And the new normal is different than the old normal. And uh, I don't think anybody here tonight has the solution, but I think it's time to start having a conversation from that place that there is a new normal. Uh, students are different. Education is going to need to be different. And... On the one hand, that can sound intimidating to talk about having to adapt to a new normal, but on the other hand, I think it's maybe also got the seeds of the solution to start having these conversations about uh, there is a new normal and we need to address the new normal. And the teachers can look at that as, oh no, even more work, but I think the teachers hopefully also, we can uh, look at that as if we're addressing the reality, that's actually addressing their job dissatisfaction and making things in the long run, better and easier uh, and there as well. So I think that framing is starting to become increasingly important. And I, I think I didn't start the strategic plan with that mind frame. I thought COVID was not going to be part of the strategic plan and it's not in the word COVID is not mentioned anything we've done in the strategic plan. But I look at the items that are risen to the top and they're all some combination of, you know, COVID, uh, modern student, social media student, all these themes of engagement and well-being and things like that, I, I feel like the strategic plan has kind of ended up in that same place of, okay, it's time to start talking about the new normal. So, you know, in terms of specifics, I felt like I heard the teachers staff were really unhappy, but I, I didn't hear there were these huge things that I could go check. We could change that or we could fix that. Or in a couple of cases that we're willing to change or fix that. But um I do think the bigger picture, this is what I take out of it, is something that needs to change is having this conversation uh, at a deeper level. Education, you know, uh, a virus nano nanomillimeters in size ran through the world and education got turned upside down. 
and it's not going to go back. I think we were all hoping it was just going to go back and it's not going to go back. So I think starting to have conversations at that level is an important thing that may be too high level or philosophical, but that's, that's, that's kind of what, when I really, what, you know, okay, so you heard the survey, what do you take out of it? That's what I take out of it. So I guess going back pre-COVID, were, were these concerns not, how is it different, I guess? Uh, well, so at the level of the surveys, the surveys were pretty different. The teachers were not as happy with us as the parents, but the teachers would not, I wouldn't qualify them as unhappy in the way that I would clearly qualify. The significant fraction, again, not universal, not even probably two thirds, right? It's not like all but one teacher, it's probably two thirds of the staff are unhappy, but no, it wasn't like that pre-COVID. And if you look at statistics with students, you know, horrible statistics like suicide rates and some of it was very much COVID. Some of it, these trends, on the other hand, very much pre-existed COVID as well. Uh, there's some longer term trends, which is why I think I invoked social media. But the two together have really kind of created a, a perfect storm. So, but yeah, the sir, I mean, Mark and Jake, you were both here too. You can tell me if you have a different opinion, but they were qualitatively different pre-COVID. Would you agree? Yeah. Were the same kinds of cons different kinds of concerns? Yeah, like the Oh, I mean, the issue du jour changes, right? Like news was an issue for a while, acceleration's an issue now. Some of the core themes of the PEV, I don't know what the board's doing. The board um, board is too, like you called out, the board is too powerful. The board doesn't actually do anything. You know, those, those things have been around forever. But um, what, I mean, honestly, what changed for me most was the kind of the quantitative the tone and the quantitative uh, scale seemed um, qualitatively different from previous years. Well, previous pre-COVID years. Yes, I didn't think it was overall that as bad as you're painting it. Okay, <laughs> actually, like it's not. There's only so happy, but I don't. I I didn't. It's like, mixed for sure. Whether well, you look at parents for the this. number of people like each staff do that were happy and they were all supportive. <laughs> yeah, there's there's lots of seconds from staff, yeah. right? And there's lots of expressions of appreciation from staff too. Everyone hates us. <laughs> well, and some of the things like uh, pay for staff is <clears throat> understandable. We're at the end of a three year contract with yep. you know recent record inflation. So you know we're in negotiations, and you know those opinions are bound to change after a contract materializes. So. That at least feels good. I mean, those are understandable, and the board and the superintendent agree that we just have lagged inflation. So um, those are always actionable or being acted upon. Like, really couldn't be acted on previously because they're in a contract. So you get kind of stuck. It's both beneficial to be in a contract, but it can also be difficult to pivot when things go awry. Yeah. Yeah. I think one other thing, just not to to drive this discussion out, but it fits in what Brian's saying is that education doesn't exist in a vacuum. Um, and there is like a lot of data out there showing that the United States are becoming are becoming increasingly or have been becoming increasingly unhappy and increasingly agitated for really the last two to three decades. And that and that COVID exacerbated that. And so again, education doesn't exist in a vacuum. If you look at you know, I don't really care what metric you pick, but you look at, you know, the metrics of how Americans are feeling about just about anything, it's not good, and it's gotten progressively worse um, over the last 20 to 30 years, and COVID really spiked that up, and it's not, it's not, nothing's improved. So, yeah. Anything else? Um, we're, I'm still have more meat to get to, so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, superintendent 360 survey. So by policy, we do do a superintendent 360 survey. By policy, the questionnaire has to be agreed to by the board. Obviously, you know, it would be possible for the board to uh, skew the results by picking the questions inappropriately. That's not, not the intention, but the, the checkpoint is that the whole board has to approve the survey. So my proposal would be that we run with a survey we had last year with maybe one or two tweaks. And again, the survey we ran last year starts with six ISLEC, International Society for Super, I can't remember, but it's like this. 
What's that? School leaders. School leaders, thank you. Yeah, it's it's basically the professional national superintendent society. And they've done an update, but their update, I think we have agreed in the past is worse. It's got more questions and more technical questions. So it's six standards, vision for learning, school culture and instructional program management, uh, collaboration with community, integrity and fairness, larger context in terms of the political, social, economic, legal, and cultural context. And then we have asked not necessarily a whole list of four goals, but a subset of goals. And last year, we asked about COVID, we asked about buildings, and we asked about DEI. So I would propose we keep the same six um, ISLIC standards, one to seven scale, and then an open-ended tell us anything you want, and an open-ended question at the end of it, tell us anything you want, but I would propose we maybe change the goals. So um, not sure, to be honest, I would ask any of those three questions about COVID or uh, construction or DEI, but uh, I'm not sure I necessarily have a proposal of anything else we would want to ask this year. We could just drop all three of the goal questions and go with the six ISLIC standards. I agree that the goal questions seem outdated at this point. <clears throat> Anybody have other thoughts? And that's fine with me. I do all, I do think that we should um, check and see if there's anything there in the particular ones. I'm, yeah. I'm definitely fine with dropping them. I think it would be helpful, and I'm not sure that you get this when you ask it in terms of how the superintendent's doing on this, but sometimes you get, you know, constructive suggestions on um, different aspects of the goals, um, you know, particularly some of those where we really got conflicting information on work to instruct all students, maybe ask a question on that. And then um, the mental health, emotional well-being, we're really working on, you know, developing goals and strategies around that. It might be helpful to see if folks have some concrete suggestions there. I mean, we did do that on the board survey where we just asked, you know, what what suggestions would you have? Yeah. Or we could ask on the acceleration, we could ask who do you like acceleration one to seven? I'm not. Sure, that's the most constructive question to ask, but we could ask an open-ended question about sure. what are your thoughts or experiences with acceleration. Well, given that we get a slightly higher return rate, we might yep. get more information. So ask a question about what are your open-ended question about thoughts or experiences about acceleration and a um, open-ended question about uh, what could be done to for well-being of staff and students? Yeah, I'm not sure I would say acceleration. I think it's important to stretch all students. Okay. It's more global. Okay, yep. Right. And, you know, strategic plan, I'm not sure about that. Um, asking that at this point, probably next year after it's been right. adopted and where people have a chance to see it, that would be the time to ask that question. Yeah, so more even public without. Yeah, we've right. just asked a couple of rounds of public input so far. It's this cross stakeholder committee. So the work has been in committee since fall. Yep. Everybody okay with that? I agree. Okay. So we'll drop three goals, keep the six look standards, and we'll add two open ended questions about challenges all students and um, well being. And is there a general open ended or? There's a general open ended at the end. Yep. Okay. I am aware that we have about four people who are probably sitting here waiting for item 9A. Do we, well, we only have one more item, but it should take a while. Do we want to jump to 9A and then come back to uh, 8C? Is COVID going to take a while? Yeah, I don't, think I don't know if it is or isn't. It has in the past. It may not. Oh, it's a different subject. Yeah. All right, let, let's just stick with the agenda. Okay, um, CDC changed our guidelines. We have, as a general rule, tracked the CDC guidelines uh, by policy and also just as a practice of board votes. So Meredith and I talked about this and um, we just thought we should bring it to a board vote again and update also because of ESSER funds, we're required to have a COVID policy. So we should update the COVID policy to match uh, the, the new CDC guidelines and also to just kind of simplify them, boil them down to basically making it clear we're tracking CDC guidance going forward so that um, could 
theoretically be the last time we revisit the COVID guidelines. What else would you add to that, Meredith? Yeah, just in consultation with Karen, uh, she knew this was coming and it kind of been plugged into the um, you know school health nurse, school nurse network about what was coming and, and is supportive of making this change. I don't want to speak for her, she's here. Thank you for joining us tonight, Karen. Um, I, I think what's, what's um, good about this changing guidance is it's become really guidance about respiratory viruses because, um, you know, in healthcare, what I what I read when I read these guidelines is um, COVID has become like flu and other respiratory viral illnesses for, you know, most individuals. And so this guidance they've given aligns um, responses for schools and other organizations other than healthcare to take, um, whether it's um, COVID or some other viral illness. So um, the, what this takes away is the required five-day isolation, um, and it takes away the required five days masking after five days isolation, and it changes to really what guidance has been longstanding um, around you know 24 hours fever-free without fever-reducing medications and improving symptoms to return to school. There is a recommendation for um, masking, enhanced hygiene practices, distancing, and, and take steps for cleaner air um, once normal activities are resumed. Um, but it's, you know, phrased as uh, recommendations. Um, and I think, you know, one thing that, that Karen knows that we're seeing, and I think it's a national trend, is, um, you know, people aren't testing like they were. So COVID is walking around. And, and I think part of that is uh, avoiding having to isolate. Um, and so having guidance that feels more um, like what people are, are going to kind of abide by um, matches with, I think, where the CDC feels like the transmission and um, I'm not sure I have the word, um, impact of uh, contracting COVID um, is more aligned with other viral illnesses at this point. Karen, would you add anything to that? Um, hold on. Hi. Um, <clears throat> just that, you know, it's just becoming another virus that's out there. And um, we have built now there's so many people that are not as vulnerable because we all have some sort of immunity, whether it be through vaccination or exposure. And they're finding that, um, you know, even though we are around people every day that are contagious and all of that, we're just not getting it like we were, you know. So it, they're not finding that it's effective anymore, that we need to mask um, unless people it individually feel that they are still, they're asking individual people to make that decision. So um, it seems to be working. It's been kind of moving to the East using this for a while, using this model for a while and it, um, and it seems to be working. It hasn't shown an increase in COVID really. So any questions, comments from the board? I still do have, um, you know, tests available. I've, the federal government has been providing tests for us to be able to send home with people. So I've offered those to families and I do have families that ask for them still. And I do encourage you know, that <clears throat> if you're sick with anything, please stay home. Or if I have a kid at school that is not feeling well, I do try to test them and um, try and still give them parameters. It's just we, we're not as firm with the five-day isolation, but we do definitely monitor the kids that are sick and staff. Great. I mean, I think you and I have talked about voting. Was your thought to bring it back another time or? Um, I think in prior um, instances, sometimes we voted and sometimes we okay. haven't. We've just 
you know, determined is this, are we still following CDC <coughs> guidance? And if so, you know, this is the new guidance and we <coughs> have agreed and other times we voted. So it's up to the pleasure of the board. But I, I think I, I would like to get out what we're doing sooner rather than later because yeah. this guidance changed on the first. We wanted to, you know, bring it to you. So we waited for this meeting. Right, what's um, going on? Yeah, let's vote. I mean, especially because this could potentially be the last policy that kind of sits up there for a long time on the website. I would make a motion to adopt the COVID uh, guidelines now reading RSU to co RSU 26 COVID and other respiratory viral illnesses guidelines as presented. Is there a second? A second. Any discussion or questions? Mm -hmm. The only comment I will make is it is for those of us, well, the three of us who are here through the duration of it, it feels like we've done a full circle, right? Like it started, things got bad, 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 and then less, 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 and now we're back background in the beginning. So yep. Any other questions or comments? All those in favor? Passes five zero. Okay. Next up we have staff nominations. We have we move three D. Oh uh three D, yes. Thank you. Yep. So uh, before we vote on who's in positions, we should vote on the memorandum of understanding for who's in the positions. Thank you. Um, May I just talk about this? Yeah. So um, coming out of stipend committee, as we, you know, wow. we, when we meet, we either consider new requests or we consider um, proposals that we need to consider an adjustment or um, sometimes we're just proactively looking through all stipends to consider whether we need to make adjustments. This. Um, adjustment request came from um, the coaching staff, um, and in reviewing it, we re um, researched kind of in the region what are the coaching configurations in tennis, um, and it's a it's a sport that is kind of tricky in a number of ways with um, a varsity and a JV but only so many spots for making the varsity matches. And so you have a lot of students who are back at school needing, you know, supervised practice or, you know, they have to cancel a lot of practices if you don't have um, another coach. And sometimes when you're going off to matches, you're um, playing in two different locations because of court uh, limitations. Um, and so, this proposal is really, and also there's a new um, state tournament that's been added. So all of those things together um, in looking at the region, we are um, recommending a change from having one head coach for varsity and one head coach for JV and one assistant coach to now instead having a boys head coach, a girls head coach, and then a assistant coach so that it's more of an overall programmatic um, coaching staff, and that's really aligned with how more um, more teams in the region are structured um, for staffing, and um, it kind of gives, I think, uh, um, also with our practices, um, we have to really stagger practices to give every um, athlete court time, so it gives the coaches kind of a more clear realm of responsibility and commensurate pay with the responsibility that that it's structured um in terms of time and responsibility so that's the reason for this sorry that was a lot of words to explain that so basically changing the position list and the stipends <laughs> attached to them i would make a motion to and this is since the stipends are put in the uh contract with the teachers um would be a, a formally an amendment to the contract. So I would make a motion to approve the memorandum of understanding between the OEA and RSU 26 board of directors related to teaching coaching stipends. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion or questions? All those in favor? Passes five to zero. So we'll move now to co-curricular nominations. And I think, um, uh, Mira, if you wanted to introduce that a little bit. Right. Um, what's a little uh, different about tonight's recommendations is on this list, there is the recommendation for um, our new track um, head coach. And I just wanted to let the board know that um, it, it's been a while since we hired a new varsity head coach that follows the GE policy of being 
of the scale of program and pay that we institute a hiring committee. Um, so for larger varsity sports at the high school, there's a requirement or policy for a hiring committee as opposed to um, other positions that either the principal or the coach interviews on their own and hires for. So this did have a, a hiring committee, much like we do for, say, when we hire a teacher. Um, and uh, Mike led that search team. He's on, on the call. And we had um, the representative members that the policy um, requires. So I just want to let you know that was a process that happened prior to us bringing this forward tonight. Great. I would motion to approve the slate of co-curriculars as presented. Is there a second? Second. Everybody okay with proceeding with the whole slate? It's bigger than usual. Um, very quickly, varsity baseball, Don Joseph, JV baseball, all at the high school, JV baseball, Griffin Costello, assistant baseball, Shane Graham, varsity softball, Chris, Kristen Espeline, JV softball, Alyssa Kubesh, assistant softball, Todd Hillier, varsity tennis boys, Zach Arnold, varsity tennis girls, Sierra Tibbetts, tennis assistant, Krista Bell, assistant track and field, Steve Dexter, assistant track and field, Lynn Weiss, assistant track and field, Brandon Crocker, assistant track and field, Emily Francis, and head track and field, Daniel uh, Julie. Uh, any questions or comments on the slate? All those in favor? Pass the slide to zero. And I welcome Coach Julie. He's on the phone. Uh, looks like he's on the line. Yeah, welcome aboard, Dan. Hope I got your name right. Uh, next up, we have school calendar. We have already had a preview of this, so this is the night we vote on it. So I'm just going to start off with a motion, then we can have discussion if we want. I would make a motion to approve the school calendar as presented. Is there a second? Second. Discussion or comments? It is unchanged from the last time you saw it, other than I added the graduation date on here after I counted days and made sure we were in good standing to put it where we typically have it. There are two shades of blue or something. Yes. Um, <laughs> the lighter blue or the darker blue are holidays. And so I think what we're, we should do is take out the pink and purple, which used to um, signify some different early release days that we took out and we just didn't take the colors out of the top. Maybe we can put blue instead of the pink and purple. With permission, we'll make that only that change after you, if you approve it tonight. Colors <laughs> Yeah, like June nineteenth is is Juneteenth. So, so the dark blue are holiday. There's no school in those days. Or? That's right. Okay. Well, and they're the uh, recognized holidays for for employees. I have holidays too. That are paid holidays. So it's more for. It, there's also no school on those days, but for employees, it signifies kind of one of their paid holidays. So that's the same. Okay, so schools are closed on dark gray and dark. Yes. Maybe we should just take that off here. I think we usually do. Yeah, we'll just take it off. But that's confusing. We put it in there. Based on their breath. Yeah, we'll just make them all gray. And then, that seems better. And then like January 8th is a early weeks. <laughs> Come yeah. having trouble this time. <laughs> okay, yeah. yeah, so looks we had talked last time about keeping the early releases to second Wednesday, which looks like that's happening. And as you all recall, uh, we don't actually have that many degrees of freedom because we have to match the UTC district wide or region wide. Uh, calendar from UTC. So in terms of start days and end days and uh, winter break days and things like that. <clears throat> Any other? Any intricacies of that. There does always seem to be the other districts have more degrees of freedom. There was a period where we ate up four of the five days of allowed deviation for years on a Yeah, on a we, we are eating up for sure one of the five days. And given that there are, well, we in, in Hamden, together are eating up one of the five days with the January 17th workshop day. No one else does that. So given that there are like, but some people start out the labor day, right? Then right. How, how can that happen? Uh, it it's strange how it I it only I think UTC starts with students that day. So we could start mm -hmm. after Labor Day and not be out of one. Right. 
So now I might have a bigger complaint. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the rationale for not starting after Labor Day is these um, ramp up starts uh, work well for kids, especially younger kids, but probably all kids. That's been pretty consistent feedback from teachers, which, you know, I, maybe a case for parents have a different interest, but that's that's been the rationale behind that. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, it looks like there, was, there isn't that week now where there used to be where you had like, no school, and then a one day, and then a half day, or like, or I think there was one week. Yeah, it happens at least once, and no matter where we put it, we tried to avoid it. But October, March, and um, January get tricky. Whether we put it in the second or third week, it just it bumps up again. And, and uh, November, it's like November bumps up against. Potentially in different weeks. So, well, I don't. I don't know whether I like this calendar, but I'm. 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 We're made enough. Of the same thing before. <laughs> and every yeah. day, everything you put into making it work with all the constraints. So I'm going to sit there. This is this is always the sausage making, right? It's <laughs> it's the, um, yeah, the could compromise everybody hates. Yeah, I mean the best. The way to resolve what I think your concern is is to not have early releases on a consistent week each month, which, as we've talked about, was a measured decision that we made based on a lot of parent feedback, you know, I don't know, four or five years ago, that um, it would be helpful if they were more predictable. And I've heard less complaints about early releases since we made that change. But... It does bump up against some holiday weeks, regardless of where we put it, if we put it somewhere consistently. I was talking to like Amelia and Ampersand saying years ago that like a release date that would be more robust town programs that made these days really exciting. Oh, I'm the chair of the town council. Yeah. <laughs> Is that? <laughs> Let's read the ordinances on something. Well, they, you know, they have a, a rec <laughs> program that they they brought back. I, I don't remember how it was different if they allowed maybe Wednesday drop ins, which they don't allow I right think now. The is overall more robust. Mm -hmm. which is yeah. More so the town, the town used to actually run after school programming themselves. Yeah. They still do. And they do. Well, they run it through the university at this point, right? Right. But it's a town program. It's a town program. It's, yeah. I, as I understand, just from word of mouth, that it's less, it's less options. There's less something. Yeah. I know, there's a whole lot of things that used to happen. I know everything was better back in the day. <laughs> I don't know. I, yeah, so so we have Pollux now. So. Yes, yeah. I love the Pollux. And yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, so are we ready to vote? All those in favor of the school calendar? Opposed? Thank you, Mark. You're welcome. Um, the rest of the board's up here laughing because Mark has made this vote for. Ten years now. Um, but once I almost got what I wanted, it was close. <laughs> and turned over. And... Uh, next up is the Penobscot River uh, Educational Partnership and our local agreement. Yes, I laid some groundwork with you about a month ago or so about this. It's um, a re imagining or re restructuring of our educational service center, which is currently under Spruce. It's in the um, electronic folder because it's quite long. So we didn't put it out uh, with a lot of legalese. Um, and this having an educational service center allows us as a region to realize more state subsidy for things we're already doing to collaborate, but it really helps us have mechanisms to support more collaboration and regional efforts, um, really for cost-saving measures or efficiencies. So um, it doesn't cause it's not going to cause us to do anything different than what we're already doing, but we're just kind of resetting this under the prep umbrella now rather than under the spruce umbrella, which it really makes more sense to be under the prep umbrella because Spruce is more of a special education focused organization and PrEP is more of a broad-based um, educational partnership organization. So um, 
That's really all, all this does. And it's a five-year agreement that automatically rolls into another five-year agreement if the um, executive board of the service center, which is the superintendent group, you know, support changing it. It's the superintendent group really that's driving this change over to um, be under the prep umbrella as the initial um, educational service center agreement is sunsetting this year and gives us the opportunity to kind of make this shift. And there just been some changes in structure and leadership that caused this to be the right time to do this. So there is a motion that they've asked you um, to read and vote on to accept this. But so yeah, so I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but as I understand it, after the attempt to force districts to merge together turned out to be a disaster, the next administration uh, tried to have districts cooperate together to save money, right? To um, whole idea was you could get rid of uh, central processes and make them bigger and more efficient. And so we we and in fact, in the law, we were required to participate. I think in one of these uh, regional cooperation centers, and it's been through Spruce. But this is effectively letting us do some purchasing and some other things centrally as well. Is that that the right? You contact? don't have to belong to one, but if you don't, you lose out on some state funding. Right. So it's a little bit compelling. Um, you know, just trying to compel people to be a part of it. Yeah, right. And but Spruce has worked out well for us and. Sounds like we anticipate some regional purchasing of paper and things is also going right. to work out there's well. A, so. There's a food purchasing cooperative that we participate in. There's um, like cooperative uh, regional contracts for through WB Mason for a lot of our supplies and furnishings that we try to see if that's the most competitive price when we're out shopping for things like that. Um, also, professional development offerings are regionalized. So just a number of transportation contracts. Some some districts are doing that. We have not um, because we've just been on a different cycle and haven't joined in that. So that might be something we look at. Okay, I, I move that the Penobscot River Educational Partnership Interlocal Agreement for Education Service Center be approved, substantially informed, presented for, to this meeting and that RSU 26 enter into said agreement and become an initial member of the Penobscot River Educational Partnership established by said agreement, subject to approval of said agreement by the commissioner of the Department of Education. Is there a second? I second. Any further discussion or questions? No discussions. I do think we should point out that it's after eight and she notes her of course free to leave or free to stay at this Absolutely. So we are finally on the downhill side of the meeting, but you're, you're all welcome to uh, meet your personal schedules. Uh, any other questions or discussion? How many districts are we today? Well, currently, I think there are around 15 of us. There are a lot. Um, and so that will be filled in once everyone goes through the process we're going through. Um, it's grown. It keeps growing because some other people who aren't in, who haven't been in prep in the past um, or haven't been in Spruce in the past have kind of heard about this and wanted to join in for to be able to reap the benefits and get the state subsidy. So it's grown over the years. Good. I don't have the exact number. I, I think it's 15, but maybe as many as 20. Down to Lake Holden and out to Herman. It's more than that, more actually. Than that. It's over into um, Ellsworth now and Bucksport oh. and uh, definitely goes up as far as like, Katahdin region and over to Greenville. So outside of the Nopscott watershed even? Yeah, it well the Pinkwoods region has it has long been kind of the prep group, which is okay. Penobscot and Piscataquis, but we're now in Hancock more. I would say that's where the growth is more in Hancock. Any other questions? All those in favor? Pass this five to zero. Uh, we dropped the construction. We've already dealt with the stipend. Next up is policies. So we have uh Two small changes to the DAI, one of them coming from the tech committee and one of them coming from the board last time. Uh, we are adopting this tonight because tomorrow there's an early release day and staff are going to do GAI um, training. Uh, so the changes, if you look at number seven, uh, we adopted this uh, only, I think, five weeks ago. And mostly in that time, 
this list of uh, acceptable uh, GAI tools have almost all implemented 18 and over uh, requirements, which kind of changes the whole story about using things in the high school. Uh, but the solution is rather than continuing to try and track something that's changing so quickly to just get rid of any kind of list it was always intended as a kind of an initial recommended list that got updated by the tech committee. And now we're just kind of like, there's no list. It just, if you're going to pick a technology to use with students, you need to have run it through the tech committee. And the tech committee is going to address so many concerns about, um, you know, using, not using a fly by night one that's going to tell you how to build a bomb if you separate the right query. So um, the other change is the one that uh, came up last time. Uh, scrolling down here to section four under uh, sec under number 11, we had built in, um, based on Marissa's feedback, we built in a right for students to opt out. And several people, I think Mark and Noah are jumping to memory, uh, pointed out that for KA students, really it should be a parent prerogative also to allow an opt out. And then for that opt out to happen, teachers have to actually disclose, you know, sending home before in advance so the parents know and can choose to opt out. So there's language to address that. It's on the last page, it's under B4. The font is a little hard to distinguish, but it's the B. Yeah, 11, 11 B4, B4, last page. Third paragraph from the bottom. Yeah, I mean, the added language for K students opting out must be made available to the parent to opt out for their student. Teachers must also uh, disclose plans for student use far enough in advance that opting out and forming alternative plans is feasible. So that's the added language there. So I would make a motion to adopt policy, well, it's not a policy, to adopt the guidelines on generative AI as a revision. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion or questions? All those in favor? Four in favor? Opposed? One against, passes four to one. Uh, subcommittee reports, policy subcommittee met. This is one of the things we addressed. There's two others that will be coming. Uh, one of them is an update on um, serving homeless students, which is driven by Sam, uh, who's our McKinney-Vento coordinator and very much just tracking what we have to do by law. Uh, the other one is a substantial effort to put some guidelines in place around uh, water-based field trips, swimming field trips, canoeing field trips, and so forth. So a lot of work, a lot of feedback from Jeff Cohen and Chad Kirkpatrick. It's, even though it's technically just one subclause of the policy, we'll, we'll treat it as a first read uh, so that there's a chance for the community to know this is happening and give us feedback, but the first read will come next week. Uh, UTC. Just had a meeting last week. I want to acknowledge, I forgot to acknowledge before, that our superintendent is the superintendent liaison. So it's nice seeing Meredith at the UTC meeting also. Um, registration is happening right now. They have a new system, which uh, apparently is uh, making it a little easier to track folks who are signing up or who are interested and in maybe not finishing uh, their application. Um, they're always growing, always doing more things. I always forget to take notes. Anything come to mind, Meredith, that you haven't shared already? Um, I, I think the registration system just feels like a big step forward for them. And I think they're hoping that it will assist with um, successful retention of students um, because mm -hmm. they have more direct communication with the system. Um, and that's been one of the problems with UTC. They, Want to make sure they have the right students and the right in the seats when the school year starts because it's hard to fill seats after the school year starts when students get in the schedule and then don't want to make a change so we're hoping that this will lead to more stable enrollment well said thanks spruce next meeting is march 28th all right curriculum subcommittees this thursday at 3 30 i think um health curriculums on there what else susan Uh, ELOs, extended learning opportunities and health curriculum. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, facilities and building. Um, we basically just killed that committee. It hasn't been meeting more or less for a year or so. Uh, wellness committee, any updates? Yeah, we met. Um, 
I think a little bit of the energy coming out of the long screw throwing them right there, slightly differently. Now. But uh, yeah, and you talked about the outdoor classroom and sort of how to, I know I actually, Carrie put it out in her newsletter, sort of how to promote use of it and stuff um, within within the school and community, letting people know about it. Talk a little bit about the, actually, you would send me the main outdoor school for all um, sort of opportunities, but this is potential. This is legislation this passed in Maine that's supposed to fund an outdoor, sort of like the, the Meredith, like the sleepaway kind of outdoor thing, opportunity for two nights for all students in Maine, but it hasn't actually been appropriated funds for it yet. So it's like, I talked to someone there that's been pushing for that and the opportunities. So there's a lot of existing places that already offer these and can buy into them, but there's not necessarily funding earmarked yet, but they're trying to get some. So just some of the opportunities about like having an eighth grade experience or fifth grade experience that everybody does going away for a couple nights to some. There's lots of centers around. So just started talking about that a little bit. Um uh let's see, we talked that we went over the wellness, the triennial policy review a little bit more and looked at sort of our scorecard on that. Um and you talked about some of the things about policy, looked at comparable other districts' policies around like food and nutrition and you know healthy snacks in the school, like the, whether it's brought by students or brought by teachers given out as part of the class or other things like there's supposed to be policies around like sugary snacks and meeting healthy food standards and whether we want to strengthen them or policy not. We talked about a fair amount and whether we could even do that effectively or there'd be too much pushback. Um, talked about uh, the well, like seat time for lunches and whether to have policies mandating that, or you know, we've been pushing for more, but there's still like you know, on ASA, often kids still only have like four or five minutes um, to sit and eat. And according to some reports, and we don't have great data on that, but it sort of comes from like the problem with scheduling in the line and all things by the time certain kids that maybe are how does it long standing yeah so uh there are some policies some districts that actually mandate 20 to 25 minutes of seat time that's sort of recommended and so like you know whether there's any way we could meet that or it's a new way we could have language about that something we talked about um it seems important uh let's see those are some of the main things. We have a, a meeting May 6th at 3 15 is the conversation. Um, yeah, and yeah, we're going to sort of work on drafting potential policy change recommendations. That was the thing we have. Okay, great. Uh, DI leadership, I think the meeting was since the last board meeting. Um, so, you know, that's kind of the umbrella committee that sits over five subcommittees, or I guess it's now four subcommittees. Um, I don't know that I have a high level summary, except there's a great amount of work still happening in each of those four subcommittees. And, um, and, I, and I think one of the things we did is we started, it's been kind of a year and we were kind of reflective. Each of these committees was kind of thinking, what do we, what do we accomplish and what do we need to do? differently or what resources or what kinds of changes do we need to do. So I feel like that structure for DEI is still working very well. And a lot of um, a lot of a lot of work is still being driven through that process of the subcommittee. And then subcommittees kind of have an accountability to the overarching committee and reporting back to the larger group. Anything you would add? Um, well, something very concrete is we've been talking about this district data analyst um, idea because we were wanting to invest in either a, a survey platform or company that can help us with surveys or someone that has expertise to help us with survey design and uh, data analysis. So we built money into the budget this year for uh, to see if we could find someone contracted service. So we've just done interviews today actually and hope to um, be able to identify, you know, one of the candidates to move forward with in the next, in the next few days. So that's another kind of step forward to something that's just grown out of that work and the need to um, just have more sophisticated expertise that has capacity to do all the things we want to do. As Brian, you know, has said, you know, he has done a lot, of, he and some others who have the expertise have done a lot of the heavy lifting around really some advanced data analysis for us and 
um, we hope that this position can help grow our capacity as a district. And kind of towards that point, just for, to report one subcommittee because I happen to be on it, but we've set up the cycle of staff, uh, student, parent, DEI surveys, and we're about next month going to do the first repeat of one of these surveys. So we'll do the staff survey for the second time. So we're starting to get longitudinal data, which is kind of, an, I mean, it was nice to do the surveys once and just see uh, where we're at, but now we're actually going to start to get longitudinal data and now we're things changing over time. So we're getting more sophisticated in what we know about our district. Uh, strategic plan team, you're all part of that. Um, we basically are in a place of, we identified six goals, and I think I reported that last time, so I'll repeat them, but it's kind of going to a smaller working group, mostly the admin team, and uh, I've been jumping into and trying to kind of work those six goals into something more concrete. And that's going to come back to the strategic plan committee, which on the April 2nd strategic plan meeting. So we're really making some progress. We got our mission, vision, portrait of a learner, um, district values, and now we have six goals. And next time we meet, we'll have, uh, you know, concrete descriptions of what those goals mean and what kind of action steps sit under those goals. So uh, it's looking like it might actually finish this year at this academic year. So that's good. Uh, any other business? Any requests for future agenda items? The floor is open for public comment. Would anybody like to make a public comment? Seeing none, uh, our next meeting is March 20th. Note, Wednesday, not Tuesday. It's 6 p.m. in the library and on Zoom. Is there any requests for information or follow-up? All right, I would motion to adjourn. Is there a second? A second. Any discussion or questions? All those in favor? Carries 5 0. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.